Our Father, we pray that you would bless your people by your word and your Holy Spirit. We pray that your word would go forth and accomplish all that it has set out to do, that it would do according to what the scriptures promise us, that it would go forth and not return back empty and void. Father, we pray for your, your people, that you would soften hard hearts and that you would unstop deaf ears and that you would open blind eyes. Lord, we pray that you give the speaker boldness and clarity of thought and that your word would go forth. And all this we pray in your name, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Who is Jesus? It's not a trick question, I assure you. It is a rather simple and plain question. Who is Jesus? You see, as we come to a familiar story this morning, a text that many of us have heard since we were young, since we were children, I'd like to focus in on the question that John asks from his gospel. The question that John seeks to address throughout the entirety of his gospel again and again and again, asking the question, who is Jesus? It's this question that he has been driving at since the opening verses of uh, chapter 1 where he tells us that this is the man who stands before you, the word, the word of God who came into the world, who became flesh and dwelt among us. The word who tabernacled among us. And he goes on throughout the rest of John chapter 1 and he tells us that this one who stands before you, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who is Jesus? Who is this man that stands before us? This man that we claim stands over us even as we declare the name and the word Christian. As we gather together as Christians and we stand under the banner of this man, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Is he a good man? Is he a prophet? Is he no one special at all? Or is he the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world? Is he the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? Is he the Son of Man and Son of God? Who is Jesus? And even... As you move from chapter 1, where the text is very much an introduction to who Jesus is, as we get into the action of the book, it's easy to lose sight of this question that stands before you as you, John introduces you to this man. Who is Jesus? And I return to this question because if John's main point, if John's main point as he writes the entirety of this gospel is to tell who Jesus is, then it should inform everything in the book, including this particular story and narrative that we find ourselves. We should be asking questions in accordance with this question. What does this event reveal to us about Jesus? What's going on here? Why would John include this particular story about Jesus? Why recall Jesus turning water into wine? What is it about this particular sign that John finds so significant that he includes it in his narrative? John, remember, isn't including everything that Jesus has ever done. In fact, the end of his book tells us, now there were many things that Jesus did, many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world could not contain the books that would be written about him and his deeds. So if John isn't including everything that Jesus has ever done, if he's being selective about what he is including, why include this particular story? Why include his turning water into wine at a wedding feast? What is John revealing to us about Jesus? Who is Jesus? Beloved, John is revealing to us much about Jesus, but he's revealing to us that the time for Jesus has come to be revealed to a watching world. This brings us to our first point this morning. The time of revelation is coming. Chapter 2 opens up, and it begins with a continued story from chapter 1. 
In verse 1 of John chapter 2, John starts out by saying, And three days later, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now, John just did something very subtle, very easy to miss, but something very important. He just made a very tight and close connection to chapter 1, especially verse 51, by using the word and as his introduction to this uh, gospel. It's often dropped in the translations, but it's the first word you come across in the Greek as you move from chapter 1 to chapter 2. And it may seem like a small detail, but John often communicates big things in little details of the text. John wants us to see a connection between the promise given in verse 51 and this narrative we find ourselves in. And so when Jesus, in verse 51, promises his disciples that they would see the gates of heaven open upon him, when he promises that they would see with their very eyes Jesus become the only way to the Father, the very ladder that brings men into the presence of God himself, bridging the gap between God and man brought about by our sin, it suddenly has a huge import into our text. In other words, what Jesus just promised the disciples they would see, we're beginning to now see happen. We are beginning to see the fulfillment of what he told the disciples. He's beginning to reveal publicly who he is and what he has come to do. That he is indeed coming to make a pathway into the presence Father. And now Jesus is beginning to enact that promise. Up until this point in time, only a few people knew who Jesus was and what he had come to accomplish. But now he will reveal to a watching world his mission. And his disciples are witnessing its fulfillment immediately. And so John, without wasting words, begins to unfold how Christ reveals himself to the watching world how he will first tell the world who he is. And John says, and three days later, there was a wedding in Cana near Jesus' hometown. And Jesus and his family and his disciples were all invited to this wedding. And very suddenly and very early on in the narrative, we're struck with a major problem. The wine at the wedding is running out. And two very old Latin manuscripts actually interpret this text and say, because of the great crowd of those who had been invited, the wine was running out. In other words, this wedding that Jesus has been invited to is a large wedding, one so big and large that even people of low status, people including a carpenter's family, and people with some very loose connection to the bride and groom have been invited. Surely the mother of Jesus and Jesus himself know this family, but the disciples who we were just introduced, who just began to follow Jesus, certainly did not know the bride and groom. And yet, they're invited to a wedding feast because they are with Jesus. This is a very generous wedding invitation. And in a real sense, that's the way it's supposed to be. Weddings in Scripture are often used as a metaphor for the relationship between God and his people. And for Israel, for God's chosen people, that means that weddings are times of celebration, times of rejoicing, times of fellowshipping with God and with one another, times of hope, times of beginning a new life together. This is a time for dancing and music, and feasting, and laughing, and yes, even much wine to make the heart glad, as Psalm 104 even told us this morning. And it's a time to be generous with your neighbor, with your fellow man. And yet, in this host's generosity, in him doing what he is supposed to do at a wedding feast as an Israelite, he has invited many to this celebration. And yet, the wedding host cannot uh, maintain his generosity to its fullest. He has stretched his resources too thin. Which again, it shouldn't come as too big of a surprise for us if uh, this really is a big wedding. You see, weddings in the ancient Near East were followed by a wedding feast that would last for seven whole days. Now just try to picture this. Try to wrap your minds around this. 
These people really knew how to party. We get invited to weddings and we get frustrated when the ceremony lasts longer than an hour. And these people, this culture, this community would wrap themselves around a couple for a week. They would drop everything they were doing, all business transactions, everything that was important that week did not matter. You went to a wedding feast and supported this couple. Why? Because of the rejoicing, because of the coming one together, because it represented God and his love for a people. This is an extremely important relational event going on where a community comes together in support of a bride and groom. And you can just imagine how much food and drink it would take to feed all of them. Just imagine how much food it would take to feed a group this size sitting here for a week. And scriptures seem to indicate that this was a feast far larger than what we have here. We are talking about an enormous amount of food for a feast. An enormous amount of wine is to be provided even for a small number of people. So we see there is a real problem when the wine runs out. Where are they going to get enough wine to maintain this large of a crowd? But more importantly is what will happen to the guests when the wine runs out? You see, because in the ancient Near East, to send your guests away is going to be a real relational disaster. Many relationships will be broken over this. And now, instead of celebration and rejoicing with this new couple and the goodness of God to his people and the good relationship of God to his people, and in this beginning of new life together, instead, the guests will ostracize this couple. Now this couple will be rejected and shamed by an entire community. They will be a source of bitterness to the community for years to come. And a place of joy and fellowship and relationship where these things are to be, only brokenness and pain and separation will remain. People of God, in a very real sense, What you're seeing before you is a reenactment of Genesis 3, where because of sin's entrance into the world, man's relationship with God is one of separation from God and pain and brokenness, all because Adam and Eve sinned against him. It's the very situation you and I find ourselves in as children of Adam. As Adam's children, we live in a world of brokenness and pain and separation, for we have sinned against God. We find ourselves separated Him, where unity and fellowship and joy once were, now is brokenness and estrangement. You can see, there is a real problem at this feast now. And the question before us is, what is Jesus Christ going to do? What will He do about it? Well, beloved, the time of Christ's revelation has arrived. The time of Christ's revelation has arrived. In verses 3 and 4, we see a conversation begin to unfold between Jesus and his mother. Mary already knows that this is going to be a big problem if the wine runs out. She knows what will happen to this couple if it does. And so she appeals to the only person she knows can do anything about it. She says to Jesus, they have no wine. And it seems like Jesus responds very harshly with her. He says, woman, what does this have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. Again, it seems harsh because in our own day, this is totally unacceptable language. It's not politically correct. And I know, for instance, that if I said this to my own mother, uh, that it would not go over very well. Uh, But Jesus, as odd as it may seem, he is not rebuking Mary. Because immediately after this conversation, she commands the servants, do whatever he tells you. In other words, somehow, In Jesus' words, Mary understands that Jesus is about to do something. Jesus is planning to do something, but it's not going to happen just yet. He is waiting for his appointed hour. So Mary prepares for this hour that is coming by giving the servants instructions, saying, do whatever he asks of you, because he's going to ask you to do it. And when he asks you, you do it. It is as sure that he will ask you to do something as the sun rose this morning. 
or will rise tomorrow. <laughs> in verse, uh, and in verse 7, we see Jesus' appointed time come. And he commands the servants to fill six stone jars with water. Now these stone jars that are used are, uh, can hold anywhere between 120 and 180 gallons whenever they are filled to the top. So this just gives you an idea about the size of this wedding feast and how large it must have been and how drastic their need must actually be. And so the servants fill them all up to the brim and Jesus tells them to take the wa water to the master of the feast for him to taste it. And this guy, the master of the feast, he's like a wedding planner. He's the one who will really be in trouble if the wine runs out. And again, we see the servants do as Jesus commands. They take the water to the head host to taste. When a sudden change takes place, the water no longer is water, but it's wine. This is no cheap parlor trick. This isn't water that has red food coloring added to it. Something has transformed this water. It has changed in its essence. It no longer is what it once was, but a change has taken place. This water has been transformed into wine. And we've witnessed a miracle has actually taken place. The substance and the accidents of the water have become something else completely different. In other words, it's not just water that looks like wine. It doesn't just smell like wine, but it has truly changed in its very essence. It's as though you have witnessed a wolf turned into a lamb or a viper transformed into a dove. The change before you is total and complete, so much so that in verse 10, the head waiter declares, here is the best wine of the feast. It's not cheap wine. It's no parlor trick. Here is good wine, better than any that has been served so far. And verse 11 tells us that through this whole event, the glory of Jesus was manifested and his disciples believed on him even more. Christ, for the first time, has revealed himself to a watching world, revealed the glory of God, wielded by a man, Jesus himself. This one who holds authority even over waters that they do whatever he commands of them. And all of this is well and good. But again, I ask the question, what does this reveal to us about Jesus? Who is this man Jesus that stands before us? What is he revealing to us by this action? Well, dear Christian, Christ is telling us that the time of restoration is now. The time of restoration is now. You'll notice everything that Jesus has done in this account so far is intentional. Jesus intentionally selects a wedding feast where things will go awry as the place where he will begin his ministry. This is the place where he will first give a sign, a sign that will point beyond what he is doing to something far greater. And this wedding imagery ought to call to mind images all throughout the scripture that depict the relationship between God and his people, a relationship that has been broken again and again and again by the people of God since Adam fell into sin and misery, even as we saw in Ezekiel this morning. God's people never seem to be able to do all that they need to. They always fall far short of the requirements of God in maintaining this relationship. And up until this point, Man's relationship to God has been marked by separation and estrangement and brokenness. But Christ comes and he flips this on its head. He turns everything around. He stops the wedding feast from ending in broken relationship and ostracization for these children of God. And he makes things right. It makes things right between God and man, even becoming the one who bridges the gap between God and man, becoming the broken body who bridges us back from or between heaven and earth. Christ reunites God to his people. And you'll notice Christ even demonstrates to us the means by which he will do this, the means by which this broken relationship will be restored. 
And he comes at a price for the God-man. You see, John, who pays attention to the details, who the details are very important, highlights for us the water jars that have been set aside. These water jars that are set aside for purification. And these are the jars that he uses to change water into wine. In other words, Christ uses waters of purification in order to bring man into a right relationship with God. Christ will purify his people. He will purify them in order to bring them into right standing with a holy God. And he does so by his very blood. Blood that the Lord's Supper later in the Gospels tells us is represented by wine. This wine is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink ye all of it. People of God... Christ came, and he came to purify a people. He came to purify them by his very blood so that his children would have perfect fellowship with God and one another so that the separation between God and man is no more. And one day, God's people will again dwell in the presence of God and play before his face. He will tabernacle with his people. He will no longer be separated from his people because of our own sin, but will dwell with them for all eternity. The good wine has indeed been kept until now, when Christ, at this very moment, enters the scene to make all things new again for the people of God. Beloved of Christ, You who by faith rest upon Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you who trust in him, you his people, you are his people that he brings to the Father so that you may have new life together with and in him. Christ has freed us from the broken relationship brought by our sin and pride that estranged us from God, and he now invites us to rejoice in and with him. Him him who has offered his own body and blood for his people. And people of God, I know we're not going to do this this morning. But come, take, drink. Remember and believe that the Lord is good. May we drink deeply of him who gives his body for the feast and his blood for wine so that we may have a new life and fellowship with a Trinitarian God. May we go forth rejoicing, for there is nothing more we can do from this God who is so gracious to a people who deserve nothing but wrath. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we praise you because your ways are not our ways. Father, we would seek to make things right in our own way by being Uh, penitent by continuing to uh, try to fix things that we've done, but yet, Father, we know that we cannot undo our sin against you. You are a holy God, and you cannot look upon sin. And we pray, Lord, that you would instead look upon Christ, who is our righteousness, who stands in our place. We, by faith, rest and receive him who is our head. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to build us up by faith in Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to turn our eyes to you, even using uh, meeble means of the word and the sacraments, bread and wine and, and prayer. Lord, we pray all these things. We pray for your people, that you would continue to sustain them throughout this week, that you would uphold them, that you would protect them as you protect your own children, for they are your children. Father, we pray uh, now that you uh, would continue to be with us as we uh, remain together to praise your name. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.